Hi, I'm Rachel Friesen with the Drupal Association. I just want to thank everyone for coming. We have a slate of four great speakers for you this afternoon. And so I will get out of the way and quickly turn the floor over. So, here go. Thanks. Hi, afternoon. Um, you guys can want to hear me okay, right? So I'm uh, excited to talk with you all today about some of the common challenges and uh, needs that we've observed in working with NGOs and nonprofit organizations for the past uh, 10 plus years, um, and talking a little bit about how OpenAid, a simple product built with Drupal, um, can help be a solution to some of these problems. Um, OpenAid is a Drupal distribution or a product built with Drupal that's specifically tailored to helping NGOs and nonprofit organizations uh, market and promote programs and projects all over the world. I should ask right off the bat, any, does anyone here work in the NGO or nonprofit space? Okay, awesome, a few of you guys. Um, does any, anyone work in kind of the corporate space? And are all of you doing Drupal development? Most of you? Okay, great. I guess for those not specifically in the NGO or, or nonprofit space, hopefully this is um, kind of a useful case study around organizing a product or a distribution around a repeated feature set. Um, for today, what I'd like to do is just talk a little bit about three quick examples of uh, websites for various nonprofits that serve as a case study for uh, high-level features or needs that we're seeing repeated over and over and over again. Um, this is not going to be super technical content. Um, honestly, not in, in a lot of cases, not the most interesting or crazy complicated things happening in these sites. But we're talking about some of the high-level design features, again, that we're seeing uh, over and over and over again. And then talk a little bit specifically about how, how those needs um, enforce some decisions or inform some decisions that went into OpenAid. Go through the features specifically for OpenAid. Uh, finally talk about version 2.0, kind of where we're going and how we'd love to see uh, you all get involved. Just first as background, my name's Justin. I work at Atten um, up in Denver, Colorado. Really uh, fun, smart team. They do, uh, we do, uh, strategy, digital strategy, design, and development. We serve a number of clients in the nonprofit NGO space. Uh, we do a lot of work with education, with environmentalist organizations, um, all kinds of cause-driven organizations. My own personal background, I grew up overseas. My parents were missionaries. I grew up in a um, small remote village in northwest corner of Ghana in West Africa a place that was so remote, every, every year the rains would come in and wash away the bridges and the rest of Ghana would refer to us as overseas. It was living there that I learned really early in my life I wanted to be involved in helping tell important stories that really impact lives all over the world. I came back to the States to go to school for journalism thinking that that was sort of the path I would take for telling these stories. Somewhere along the way, found and fell in love with the internet, convinced a friend that we should start an agency. That was back in 2000. Um, since that time, we've had the incredible privilege of working with all kinds of organizations doing exactly that, helping people tell stories that are impacting lives all over the world. Over the past few years, we've been talking a lot about focusing, again, on common needs and looking at um, what are some of the design patterns, what are some of the uh, technology needs that we're seeing repeated over and over again. And again, what I'd like to do is just show uh, three quick examples of websites that demonstrate some of these high-level design and functionality elements that we're seeing repeated over and over again, how those show up or impact OpenAid, um, and then again, kind of where we're going with the product and how to get involved. First organization I'll talk about is Results for Development. Results for Development is an international nonprofit that is working to unlock some of the hardest problems around um, healthcare and education in the developing world. They have, uh, there are a few ways they go about executing this mission, um, primarily around making healthcare innovations and education innovations available to people in the developing world. Uh, one of these platforms is Center for Education Innovations, or CEI, um, promotes, just like it sounds, promotes education innovations in the developing world. We'll just kind of go through a few of the, the features, again, from this site. Um, starting with this kind of strong hero image, it was very important for CEI to quickly make that human connection and kind of boldly make the human connection and human relevance for their work. A mission statement, so a prominent mission statement to say exactly 
who they are and why they exist. Uh, certainly not specific to NGOs or nonprofits, but they had the need for blogs, for multi-author blogs, and for blogs that in turn that were tied to projects and programs. Programs are core to what CEI does, to how CEI executes its mission, the ability to surface specific programs, highlight programs, as well as provide a fast search for allowing users to drill down to programs was very important. It was important for CEI to then tie those programs to geographic, specific geographic locations, um, both to visually demonstrate the impact of their work, but also to provide a more meaningful, more rich uh, user experience for navigating these various programs in the world. And finally, another key part of how CEI executes its mission is a research library um, and making original research materials available to its public. A lot of other stuff going on in the site that we won't get into. Again, want to kind of stay on these features that we're seeing over and over again. Um, next organization I want to touch on is World Resources Institute, or WRI. WRI is a global research institute concerned with protecting the environment, specifically concerned with protecting the environment from a perspective that says a healthy environment is core to um, economic opportunity and the well-being of people everywhere was very important for WRI to present itself not only as a research organization, not even only as a research organization concerned with environmental issues, as important as that is, um, but also more specifically as an organization that's directly impacting human life through this work. They're doing that again through this strong imagery throughout the site. So there's this hero image feature from the, the homepage, a prominent mission statement, Again, multi-author blogs, the ability to tie blog posts to programs and projects, ability to promote programs and projects directly through program and project pages that serve as a hub into various information related to those projects and programs. Mapping, just like CEI, for showing the global relevance for these programs and projects and providing an interface for accessing those. And finally, once again, a resource library for making original research publications available to their public. And it's not, you know, the, in the case of WRI as well as CEI as well as so many of these organizations, uh, research materials are not just an important byproduct of what they do, it's core to the execution of their mission. The third and final project I'll um, just run through is ICTJ, the International Center for Transitional Justice. They're concerned with issues around transitional justice. They work with nations to recover from massive human rights violations and abuses. Again, very important for ICTJ to quickly and powerfully make the human connection, the relevance of what they're doing. They're doing this again with this prominent um, hero image. Very similar to blogs, they needed the ability to aggregate news from the industry promote news from the industry, tie that news to their programs. Again, publications are core to what ICTJ does, the ability to quickly find via a fast, powerful search interface, quickly find publications and see, find related publications was important. Program pages that present programs and projects in a compelling way, and again, serve as a gateway into related information around those pro projects and programs. And once again, uh, interactive mapping. Um, mapping that serves as both a kind of visual uh, demonstration of the global impact of this work as well as a navigation device. Um, these are just some of the features that we've seen. You know, again, they, they pop up over and over and over. They pop up specifically in NGO and nonprofit. I know a lot of these reach far beyond those as well. Um, a a few years ago, we started working with an organization called k for health and it provided an opportunity to look at creating a product around this feature set, which is very interesting. k for health is a, um, or Knowledge for Health, is a health organization that disseminates information in the developing world, specifically around um, reproductive and maternal health. One in, a, in addition to working with k for health to redesign and kind of reimagine their suite of web products, 
um, we worked with Kafer Health to serve their affiliate organizations, and they were working with a number of affiliate organizations to stand up distinct websites distributed across multiple platforms, multiple technologies. It's a mix of WordPress, Drupal, various Drupal versions. Um, the kind of the lack of standardization, while they had certainly the team there had the technical expertise to quickly spin up these sites, um, the lack of a standardized, centralized application um, and technology approach was increasing cost of maintenance and increasing kind of time to market and especially cost of maintenance um, over the long term. So we worked with K4Health to build a product that helped rein in all of these sites or these distinct properties onto a single platform, which was the beginning of OpenA. K4Health graciously sponsored OpenA becoming a fully fledged project on Drupal.org, um, where it is available for download now. And it has many of the features, again, that we've been uh, talking about here. OpenA features partner profiles to specifically spotlight partners for NGOs and nonprofit organizations, interactive mapping, news, uh, program profiles for marketing programs and projects around the world, image galleries, again, a resource library with a solar, with solar faceted search for quickly finding resources, blogs, profile pages, and again, that prominent kind of hero image feature. This is just a quick look of a couple sites spun up with OpenA right out of the box, and we're seeing some of the features here with the hero image and the hero statement, I, or the mission statement, I assume. Um, I, I don't read Chinese. Um, and spotlighted partners. We're working on OpenA version 2.0, which is exciting. Um, working on a uh, new design for OpenA, um, as well as a more th uh, thorough, improved implementation of responsive for working with various devices, simplifying content types, moving mapping from open layers into leaflet, a um, number of other enhancements. I would love for you all to get involved if you're considering a project that is concerned with uh, promoting and marketing programs for your NGO or nonprofit. We'd love it if you take a look at OpenAid. The website is openaiddistro.org. It is a Drupal project at drupal.org slash project slash openaid. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter at openaiddistro. Um, I think that's it for today. Thank you all very much. I've got a couple minutes if there are any questions. And otherwise, just thanks for your time. How's everyone doing? Woohoo. We're good. Woohoo! Is it the last day of DrupalCon or no? Tomorrow's last day, right? Okay. Well, hi, my name is Josh. It's going to be really hard to keep me to actually stay right here on the microphone. I'm used to walking around. But, uh, but I work for a company called Esri. I'm going to talk a little bit about that too. But really what this 15-minute uh, this talk is uh, that I'm going to be doing is really just to kind of talk a little bit about what we're doing as a project at Esri uh, to connect the Esri maps, uh, the Esri mapping technology, and connect it to Drupal so you can dynamically show your, your Esri maps or any mapping you're doing on Esri uh, to actually display in, on your Drupal-powered websites. So it's something we just started recently doing, and it's very much a, a, uh, um, like a project right now and, and almost like a beta phase. We do plan on it launching uh, at the end of this month on Drupal.org, at least the first phase of it. Um, but really, more than anything, just want to kind of Hopefully this kind of whets your appetite a little bit about what we're doing and, uh, and even just showing maps in terms of storytelling. I know Justin was just kind of bringing a little bit of that up, which is cool, and, and not even planned at all. So, so a little bit about Esri. I, uh, has anyone heard of the Esri before? Oh, cool. Oh, about a little more than half of you. Um, well, we're all very much used to uh, like mapping and mapping technologies. When we think of maps, we usually think of like a lot of us here know Google and Bing as far as, uh, you know, the getting from point A to point B and all the visualization side, which is great. And uh, we do that too, but we really focus on like the questions. So as we focus on like, you know, where does Starbucks put their next location? 
um, you know, they put the demographic data in and it displays uh, answers to those questions on a map. Uh, it also, you know, where does, you know, the health industry may use it for trap, you know, tracking new traces of the bird flu and things like that. And they're all, they can start seeing some trends and see if it's going maybe into like a rural or a suburban area and they could set up containment areas or things like that to prevent, you know, things from happening like that. Uh, I mean, really any type of, any industry you can really imagine it, this is in and this technology is in. And Esri's been around for about 40 years or so and uh, it's been a long time, you know, software company doing that. But one thing I want to really get into uh, today is, is how we're able to, how we're able to really try to do some storytelling, but not just, just storytelling in general, but how we're even, why maps, why even using maps? And right now, there's been this, like about three or four years ago, we've always, we learned that we need to actually start doing visualization. You know, we've really gotten visual lately. People only do, what is it, two to three seconds, I think, is the average of people that spend on a web page right now. So we, you know, we're living in such a fast-paced world where people are spending just such a quick amount of time. So we've learned that we need to really get our message across quickly and effectively and efficiently, really quick. And since people are just spending a little bit of time, you only got that, that little that minute. And we've learned to really do that with visualization, with imagery. Um, but as the, uh, as, as the web continues to evolve, we're starting to learn, too, that instead of just with uh, you know, static imagery, we're starting to learn, too, to start showing and, and embedding applications to actually not only have them get the message, but also to have them engage with the message, engage with what they're doing, what, what you're doing, um, answering, you know, solving you know, issues to their problems. They can do it on your website. You know, no, no less telling and more showing, right? So it's, it's kind of a, a thing that's starting to go on in this pattern that we're seeing. And actually makes a lot of sense as to why you know, Justin would have... Uh, you know, a lot of uh, maps in, in, his, in the stuff that he's doing to, to actually show, you know, certain, you know, answer questions or answer, uh, you know, have specific answers to specific questions. But, and just to kind of drive that point home a little bit, it's, you know, you look at this and what's, the, what's easier to process, right? Nice little test, but right at, right at the beginning you can kind of just see what's a little easier to process. The one on the left, which is just numbers and, and stuff, and actually seeing the trends on the right through a geographic map. But when, when I'm saying, and when I'm saying storytelling, because storytelling is starting to become a bit of a buzzword. You know, this, a lot of marketing people talk about, you know, their platform story or their product story. But what, one of the things I want to kind of talk about is when I'm thinking storytelling, I'm thinking almost like the dawn of our time storytelling where, where this, you know, stories that were, that were driven, that were given, were, would, like, would actually start encompassing an opinion or, or, or make somebody feel something pretty powerful. And, and storytelling does that. It, it always done that. There's probably, I, don't, I doubt that anyone in this room has, uh, has not been impacted some way in their lives by a story, it, you know, whatever it may be. So we can, as we, as we actually think of applications, as we think of things uh, you know, to do and to deliver on your website, to deliver your message or your application itself, you know, how you try to think of it in terms of being able to connect with them, turning that promotion into emotion. Um, and geographic and, and, and geography is one way to really connect with someone emotionally. We all have like a tie-in or something like that to where we're from, where we're at. Um, and here's just a couple little samples of just screenshots that I found on storymaps.esri.com uh, this morning. But uh, if, if you guys want to write that down, I should have probably written the slide. But you can actually go to storymaps.esri.com and build one of these, just sign up for an account or whatever and do it. But it, it's simply like the one on the very bottom on the left is one that actually shows like Walmart and Target and Sears and where they're putting all their locations. They're kind of going after the market share in certain areas, and you can kind of see it in geography or geographically. Um, you know, and of course, on a more local side of it, like if you're local from Cape Cod, you know, you can see some of these um, you know places places to buy fresh fish or fresh vegetables or whatever it is in the area. But enough of that. I wanted to really kind of now just take the rest of the time to show you a little bit about what we're really what we're doing with this whole connection to as we mapping and as we mapping technology in Drupal. So I'm just gonna click this on really quick. Cool. Okay. Good. I'm gonna do the dreaded like demo and hope it doesn't hope it doesn't break on me. Okay, cool. So I found. Um, put this up. So 
what this map, what this actual module does is if I go to first, if I go to configuration, it's going to be difficult to actually talk in this thing while doing this. Can you guys still hear me if I don't like actually talk in the microphone? Okay. Yeah, I'll do that really quick. That's way better. So if I go to configuration, I can scroll down to uh, Esri Maps. So I just installed the module a little bit ago, and I, I click on it. Now, ArcGIS Online, you have to connect it with your ArcGIS Online account, which is the Esri Mapping platform. Now, this is a, well, and if you kind of want to know what that is, that's, this is ArcGIS.com right here. So you can go to this site, you can sign up for account, and then what you do is you would just click connect account, and you know, it would just bring up a little username and password, you put it in, and it's done. So just for sake of time, I won't show that, but I'm going to go ahead and click add a map. Quick, since I have to type, I'm going to put this here. And right now, this is, like I said, this is a, pro a project and like a very much a prototype. So there's a lot more UI stuff we're going to do to make this a lot better and easier. But what it first does is ask you to put in a placeholder ID. So I'll just put DrupalCon. So this is an ID to get your map to render. Are there's developers in this place. Okay, good. Oh, awesome. And I'm just going to do the name of this. And then it asked me for an item ID. Now, this is the web map ID. And this morning I looked and I found this really cool. Let me see if I can make that a little better for you. Ha, that's a little better. So here's a map I found earlier uh, today. And it's a tapestry map that has a specific segmentation of different areas of where you may, you know, of just the United States. So I click on it. And it shows uh, specific details. And this is not too big. Okay, there we go. Uh, specific details of like the area. At the top, this screen is a little squished, so it's not able to show, but it shows this is Riverside County. And I can actually click on the full description of what this county is, and it says that this is like, you know, up and coming families area. That this is what the most of the, the demographic is. It kind of explains a little bit about the demographic, how four point five six percent it's up. Uh, socioeconomics, you know, 76,000 is the average um, amount people are making there. I mean, it even goes super deep by looking about preferences and how most people have car loans and mortgages, and uh, they like to mow the lawns and stuff like that and play softball and take kids to the zoo in this particular area. So a lot of powerful information. So I, I'm going to go ahead and I think that's kind of cool. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab this map ID. Cool. And I'll just plug it in here. Perfect. And I'll just switch it to a web map since that's what it is. And yeah, I want to have the zoom slider on it. So now I'll scroll down. And you could set like min and max and all that stuff if you want, but I won't do that. Cool. So there's my DrupalCon demo one. And here's my ID. So now I'm just going to go to the content. Page and for sake of time, I'll just edit an existing page, and I'll just change this to DrupalCon. Cool. So this is where that ID rendering comes in, and then I just save it. Cool. So we'll go ahead and take a look at it. Might take a second for it to load. Wait for it. Wait for it. There it is. Cool. So here's my, uh, so here it is. It's now rendering on my page, and it, here it is. It's there. So you no longer have to do these iframes and get all really heavy into the HTML to display these maps. And as you can see, this is, it's all very much the interactive map, you know, with the zoom and, and everything. And we're going to start getting a lot more further along with this. So by the end of the month, this will uh, be available on Drupal.org as it is right now. Uh, it's going to be called Esri Maps for Drupal. But we're also going to be uh, continuing to update it in the upcoming months to get rid of even that, that slightest bit of HTML that you're doing by putting an ID in the tag. Um, instead, it's just going to be pulling in like within thumbnails, and you just select the specific map you want, including it connecting to your ArcGIS Online account. So any private ones you do or, or even public ones you do personally, you can just select it. It shows up. Just say what content page you want it on, and you're done. So uh, let me see if you think I have. I'm just waiting for the lady to stop me. Cool. 
So here's just a little bit of information. If you want to get started, even now you can go to go to ArcGIS.com and you can sign up. It is free. If you want to sign up, of course, if you want like a lot of like an organizational account or something like that, then that's not free. But um, but just to get started, you go ahead and do this, and you'll be all set. And then uh, if you want to follow me, I think on the very first slide, here's my Twitter handle. Uh, follow me because I'll go ahead and provide like information of what the latest thing is going on with this module if you're interested. Or, or if you just want to say hi, that's cool too. But, uh, but yeah, follow me and I'll, I'll keep you updated. And I'll let you know this also once it goes out on Drupal.org. And, uh, and you can also, it looks like you can rate this session. So please rate it. And thank you very much. Oh, and if you have questions, I'm going to be hanging out for a little while, so. It's quiet in here. I will, it's just a video right now. Let's see. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Ben Thomas. I'm the development manager and solutions architect at a Woasting company called Unleash Technologies. Woasting is the synergy of web and hosting. And today, I want to talk about Drupal architecture. Um, as a solutions architect, um, there's always this problem with how do you best document the actual architecture of a Drupal website? Um, and I'm sure there are many developers and architects that have asked the same question. Um, you know. We at Unleash Technologies, we've tried a number of different things to try and figure out how to get your content types, your display modes, your fields, your static blocks, your views, all these different resources. How do you communicate how you need to, or how a developer, or designer, and a project manager should actually create these resources once you set them up, or once you as the architect decide how they should be created? Uh, a number of problems come into play even as the architect once you decide how it should be implemented. Uh, there's a number of different ways to do things in Drupal. Um, so if you say, hey, I want to create a content type with X, Y, and Z fields and add this display mode and do these different things, um, you as the architect may understand a particular way to do that, but the developer may do it in a completely different way, which may work, but not necessarily work with everything else that you have planned as the architect to have in your Drupal website. Um, and in the past, you know, we've, we've done large Word documents. We call them creative briefs um, that... Uh, essentially is the entire plan for a project. You can do Excel spreadsheets, project management task lists. Um, but at the end of the day, when you've got you know, a lot of content types, a lot of display modes, a lot of fields, a lot of these different resources, and you need to figure out how to actually re relate them together and know that, hey, this content type is done because it's been created and because it has all these display modes, these fields, these different resources attached to it. And uh, something that we have created that we think helps to solve this problem is called Drupal Briefs which I will explain more about in one second. But before I do, I want to just give an example of, um, you know, as an architect, what you deal with on a daily basis for actually creating these sites. And I'm going to do that by taking a look at a wireframe. So let's just say this is the home page for what we call the Travel Mag magazine. Um, it's just a, a, a magazine we have created to use for demonstrations. Um, now there's a lot going on on this page, um, as we see here. You know, we're kind of counting the different blocks and views and things that are going on in the site, and th there's a ton of stuff. And actually, I believe it'll end up counting to 22. Yes. So we have 22 different pieces of this page. And it's not even just necessarily 22. You know, we also need to look at just in number 11 right there. Where is that image coming from? How are the links being added in? Um, what's making the view all button? Um, how is all of this coming together? And as an architect, you have to look at these wireframes that your designers and your developers provide and be able to translate it from wireframe into what we might call Drupal speak. And our answer to that is Drupal briefs. Uh, we call it Drupal briefs because uh, we, use, we, we create creative briefs um, as a plan for a project. And it's also a good excuse to put tidy whities on the Drupal logo. <laughs> um, 
And I want to kind of introduce you to what Drupal Briefs is. So um, it's not a Drupal module, but it's actually a symphony application that we've built that allows a, an architect or a developer to come in and enter the different resources that are available. Um, so on the left-hand side is the list of the different resources that's available, content types, views, as I already mentioned. Um, and you, is, you, you can go in and add everything that's going on in the website. Um, and here's an example of one of those particular resources. This is a page. And on the page, you can enter in the name, the description, how long it'll take, and actually, as we go further down, be able to add the different views and blocks um, that are being used on this particular page, or if they already exist in the system, be able to add those existing resources in. Um, so really what you're doing here is, you know, you're looking at the wireframe and you're, and you're picking it apart piece by piece and saying, okay, for this particular point right here, I know that it needs to be a view. And maybe uh, we need to call that view top three blog posts, and I'm going to put it on this page right here. So this starts to solve part of the problem in that you're able to relate the different kinds of resources to a particular page. So you're starting to solve some of that relationship problem that you can't have really in it. You can't really do well in a Word document or in an Excel spreadsheet. Um, and once you create this page, you then get another view that actually, you know, in a much nicer way, uh, shows what is going on with this page. So you, know, you have uh, the estimated time, the status, and this can be for developers, it can be for designers, project managers, even clients. If your client wants to see you know, what is it that you're doing with the site, perhaps they're a little more technical, you can send them here and you know, they can say, okay, it looks like they've got all of these things, they thought about all of these things, um, and hopefully feel good about it. Um, You'll see here below, you know, a description of the page, um, a reference. In, in Drupal Briefs, we refer to a reference as a design or a wireframe. Um, so not only are you relating different views and blocks with this page, but there's a capability, which I'll show on the next slide, to actually take the wireframe and annotate it. So you annotate the wireframe and say, okay, not only are we saying that the primary article teaser, as we see down there in the bottom left, is a view that's on this page, uh, we can also see that it exists in a particular point. So your developer or your designer is going to know, okay, not only am I creating this view, but I know it needs to look like this. Um, and really, this is how a particular resource page is going to look for pages, for content types, for display mode. So say I were to click on that primary article teaser in the bottom left. That's going to bring me to the page. It's going to tell me all about the view and all the different relationships that that particular view relates to. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, this is an example of the image annotation ability that exists in the system. Um, so I can actually drag all, you know, all over the design and the wireframe and be able to say, okay, this is the article teaser, that's the multimedia block, that's the advertisement block, and um, it's not quite to the point yet, it actually is still in an alpha stage. We're, we're, we're building it for our, our internal use, but we feel that it's at the appropriate point where, you know, if people have these problems as well, which we believe a lot of people have these problems um, for just from the people that I've talked to. Um, we wanted to open it up to people to be able to start you know, adding their own briefs in and see if it can help solve this challenge of there not really being a, a widely used architecture system that helps to document all of this. Um, so uh, along with the wireframe, that really leads us to sort of a summary of what Drupal Briefs is. Um, as I mentioned, it's a symphony application, and the whole point is that um, throughout this entire process of being a developer or being an architect, um, there's so many phases that these Drupal sites go through, and as Drupal sites get bigger and bigger, um, you know, us as architects and developers are going to have more problems with trying to communicate to all the different people that need to be involved in a project how best to build something, what's the right way to do it. Um, and then once it's actually built, not to have to go back through a 100-page Word document that is the entire scope of the entire project, um, but be able to use an application that's friendly for you know, developers, for designers, for project managers, for clients, where they can go and they can say, okay, you know, I've got this portfolio, portfolio item content type that has these eight display modes and these six content types and belongs in these four views. And I can say, okay, it looks like we're good because I have my repository of information right here, and on my Drupal site, I can see that all of these things that I say have been built have actually been built. And this is actually available at drupalbriefs.com if anybody wants to go take a look and sign up and uh, start adding some briefs in. As I mentioned, we are still in an alpha stage, so we're looking for feedback to see you know, what are some things that we can add to make this better, um, and uh, really just to kind of uh, help everybody be better architects at Drupal. Um, so with that being said,
thank you very much, and I'll take any questions that anybody has. Drupalbriefs.com, yeah. Just right there and just put a dot .com on the end of it. Hmm. All right. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, I'm uh, Hassan Bawad from Magic Logics. Uh, I will be speaking about marketing automation. So, does anyone care about marketing automation or use marketing automation? All right. So, basically, uh, I'm in Dallas, Texas. However, I had the, uh, you know, the luxury to work with some clients from Silicon Valley, and these clients are usually technology companies and based on our uh, experience with them the last two years and a half we basically uh, learned from them the trend of marketing automation and how it's being applied to b2b especially websites but right now you know amazon is using it and ebay so i wouldn't say it's just b2b so the, this trend is basically very important and uh, it has a big impact on your website and most important we have applied it with uh, Drupal websites and I want to share with you you know what's marketing automation how you can start using it and a showcase of uh, that one customer we had from Chicago all right so basically as I mentioned I'm from Magic Logics we're a digital marketing agency um, I manage Magic Logics, and I'm an author. I even wrote a book about, you know, how to work with marketing agency. So, with that being said, I won't talk much about, you know, Magic Logics. I want to focus about, you know, the marketing automation and what it does. Basically, it's a, a way to simplify your sales process and to empower your leads. It's basically giving your potential leads more data and based on their IP addresses or their behaviors. We do lead scoring, lead nurturing, and basically automated emails based on that, yeah, that lead. So with that being said, you know, the key benefit, it, of course, empower your marketers and empower your sales team. It basically improve the company uh, sales structure and most important, the uh, the output of your lead program so why we try to do this you know whenever you empower marketing automation you are sending personalized data to your end user and that's the whole goal of marketing automation and of course you know uh, there's so many actions are being uh, you know um, uh, triggered to the end user while they accessing your website without you know interfering with your sales team so there are a couple of existing plugins that exist on Drupal website I want to share with you and basically these plugins they're uh, plug and play so they're very simple and you can go to these plugins from Drupal one of them Marketo Marketo is one of the top two uh, marketing automation uh, companies in the world they actually, you know, Marketo and Eliqua, they're the top two companies based on the, you know, statistics nowadays, and they are focused on medium and large size companies. So you can go and download this uh, Marketo code uh, from the Drupal site, and basically all what you have to do, they call their code Munchkin code, which is like Google Analytics code. So they give you an API number whenever you log into your code, you, whenever you log into your account or at marketo.com so basically that will identify your account and it will sync directly with your site and basically it will track everything on your site and sync it to your marketo account so the way it is basically it's taking some data from your site send it to your marketo account which is the marketing automation software and then from there, you know, it, it will send it to your CRM. So if you're using any sort of CRM, such as Salesforce or Dynamic CRM, it will send that data to your Dynamic CRM, 
and based on that, all that data is also accumulated in your Google Analytics. I'm sure it's a little bit complicated, you know, process, but once you start using it and practicing it, it's very, very, very helpful to your sales team and to your marketing team. Um, another product or another plugin uh, I want to mention is Aliqua. Aliqua is a very famous uh, product. Uh, also, it's a marketing automation company. They're both expensive. They're not cheap. You know, uh, they're at least uh, three, four thousand dollars subscription a month. However, you know, uh, as I mentioned, they're very powerful product for your sales and marketing team. And uh, Aliqua also, you know, there is a plugin for it at the Drupal site, where you can download it and you can integrate it with your Drupal site. Uh, Again, you know, they're uh, very helpful in building forms. They usually use them in the Drupal sites whenever you have a form. So let's say you have a contact form, request a code form, download a demo form, uh, any sort of white paper, webinar, uh, usually you create a form to capture leads. So that form is being triggered either as an API or as an iframe from these marketing automation products. And with that being said, that these data that are being triggered, are uh, being collected, that's where we're triggering some action back to the end user. Why are they filling the form? Why are we validating their data before we send it to the CRM? And as they as they filling the form, as soon as they fill the form, they start getting automated emails based on their action. So that's the whole idea of making sure the marketing automation is an automated process before uh, you know uh, interacting with the sales team so the last one i will discuss is basically you know um, a let's say you don't want to use any sort of commercial product and you want to start using marketing automation on your own so there is a you know generic product that or plugin that's built in on drupal that you can start using it and i'm sure this is one that it may, you know, it may be your first resort to start using it as a beginner in marketing automation, and it's very, very helpful. And you know, one of the things I mentioned, you know, you can start creating, you know, individual cookies for your uh, end user and start tracking all their data. And of course, you know, based on their behaviors, you start triggering some actions. So with that being said, uh, I want to touch on some specific examples what you can do with it. So let's say you are coming from, you know, uh, hospitality industry and you are basically right now you're working eight to five at your, you know, at your uh, company. So based on your IP address, if you visit my site, I can identify that you are coming from this company name because it's a you know a static IP and based on your industry I can start showing you content you know without you knowing so all my white papers my demos my webinars on-demand webinars any resources data that I want to show you you know it's gonna be based on your industry so what does that mean that means I'll be making my website tailored to you and to your industry Moreover, if I want to be more and more sophisticated and very intelligent with using my data, what I can do, basically, I can track what you have done on the previous page. And whenever you come to my client page or to my services page, the sidebar content that you usually see on pages or the footer or that, you know, cross-sectional marketing content, I can manage what to display. And all of this is is a generic rule I can place with my backend in Drupal or with my marketing automation product and it will apply to all users. So it's not just like I'm doing this just because of your behavior today as a specific user. You know, I can do it as industries, you know, specific or I can do it as, you know, um, client specific or I can do it as size specific or any data that you even have on generic libraries like LinkedIn accounts or, you know, data.com or lead411, all these data, you know, it's accessible. 
So based on what I'm collecting from your IP address, I can manage my data or my website content. So that's number one of making my website very personalized to you. But my second you know, action is not just making it personalized to you, to you triggering automated actions before, you know, right now, let's say I'm at the show and I have a marketing website, you know, with marketing automation uh, implemented in it. So if you come and visit my website today and basically you fill the form, you know, the my marketing automation process will send you back an email telling you thank you, thank you for visiting the site. This is a link to download, you know, our latest white paper. This is our latest showcase study and so and so. So it started the sales process without the sales people start being involved in this process. So basically that's how you, you know, what do you usually get from Amazon or from these similar type of websites. So with that being said, this is very specific on how you can start using marketing automation within Drupal and what are these plugins that you want to utilize. And most important, you know, uh, what's the difference between uh, all three of them. Now, you know, I've seen at the show there's some more and more marketing automation companies are starting to being, you know, um, exist. Uh, we saw one at the show, it's called Automator. Uh, there is HubSpot, I'm sure everybody knows. It's more for s small companies. They have their own marketing automation. There's uh, Genius, there's another product. So it's a very, very big trend and they are you know, integrating marketing automation with big data. So these are things that you're gonna see more and more in the coming years and you're gonna see it's a must for every medium and large size company. Uh, finally, you know, I wanna share with you uh, a showcase that we have done basically we designed developed and you know we managed this site and most important we integrated marketing automation on this site and I will show you some examples you know uh, how we have done it so this is a uh, company in Chicago based and basically you know this is the layout of their home page and um, you see they have this video demo it's basically once you click on it it will take you to a white paper or to, uh, I mean, to a landing page. Before you view the demo, it will pop up a, you know, a form that you fill out to collect your data. Uh, this is just to show you uh, how responsive we have made the site, you know, it's different versions and how we basically were able to make everything responsive and whenever you're on any device, we can still collect your data. Uh, these are basically just a screenshot of uh, deep inside pages of the site. Uh, but most important, this is the one that I want to show you. It's a typical landing page, you know, so if you are, you know, uh, inviting people to an event like DrupalCon, you know, you can throw this page in and basically that's how you collect data. So these data are coming from Marketo in this, in this case and this market was integrated with the Drupal site. So whenever a user fill this uh, form, the data of course are being stored in our Drupal database or MySQL database. But at the same time, the data are being synced to Marketo. Marketo is triggering actions and elevating lead scoring based on the end user, how, how many pages they visited, where they came from, did they just download one page or two or three or and so on? So all of these, they add the lead scoring, you know? So lead scoring can be 10%, can be 90%. And based on that percentage, you know, we trigger more action. The last thing, you know, is being happened. Everything is all automated. All these data are being sent, you know, to Salesforce in this case. This company used Salesforce, you know? so. We can integrate uh, marketing automation with any CRM, it doesn't matter. So in this case, it's being sent to Salesforce. So the end user, you know, are getting uh, uh, the data without, you know, uh, the salespeople are getting these data with all spiced up, meaning everything that they need to know about this end user, they are collecting. Most important that I wanna tell you about this we integrated a technology called demand base, which is a 
a company that provide you more uh, information about IP addresses. So what, ha what usually happens, you know, a user comes in and they put their Gmail account and their fake company name in order for them to download a white paper or a demo or anything. So what we have done, we put this demand-based technology between the website and uh, marketing automation. And what it does, it collected a second field and based on their IP addresses, it provided their real name, the real company name, the real email from a global database, you know, and these companies, they have verified, of course, data, and they connect to, you know, to uh, resources such as data.com. So whenever, at the end, it landed on salesforce.com in the CRM, so a salespeople open a lead and see the fake name that they put in or the fake data they, they put in and the real data that they put in. And that's why sometimes, you know, whenever you visit any generic, you know, website, you start getting from them these emails, you know, or, you know, even phone calls and so on. So basically, the, that's just another example. Uh, finally, you know, you can tag content. So this content is taggable based on your action. Even, you know, this metric is taggable based on the content type. So whatever the user did, you know, in the previous uh, page or based on their industry, we show them the content that we, you know, we identify, for example, let's say five tags, and these are industry tags, and we start showing content based on these tags. Uh, same thing in here, you know, uh, this is a resources page, so you filter out data based on any filter you want, but also you can sh see the tags are being tagged based on the content, and the content, you know, is applicable to the, I to the end user IP address. It's a little bit complicated, but basically, you know, all what you are trying to do, you are tagging personalized content to the end user. That's the whole idea. And uh, basically, that said, uh, basically, this is a little literature about Magic Logics. We're the only company uh, worldwide that has partnership with Magento, which is the top e commerce management system, Drupal, as you know, top content management system and Marketo, you know, top marketing automation product. So our team is in Dallas. We are, you know, uh, we have certified people from Magento and from uh, Marketo, and we have official partnership with all these three of them. And uh, basically, this is just uh, some client of us. Uh, we even done uh, work for Marketo itself. And uh, basically, that's it. If you guys have any questions. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks for coming. Um, the closing session is going to start at 3.30, and I'd invite you all to come join us and uh, wrap up DrupalCon and hear where DrupalCon 2015 will be. So we'll see you there.